faith, understanding the one and only condition of salvation. All right, here's a parable. Imagine that there was a wealthy guy who's into fitness. My wife is really into fitness. I don't know if you've met Abby. Uh, she is. She hates saying that fitness is her hobby. I say fitness is her hobby. She, for some reason, that really bothers her. But she's at the gym all the time, every day. In fact, today was her very first class te teaching a CrossFit class. You know, CrossFit is. She, she's gotten really into that. Too. And uh, I'm into fitness too. But fitness pizza in my mouth. <laughs> fitness is burger in my mouth. But she's uh, she's about as fit as can be. But imagine someone who is wealthy guy, really into fitness, and so he starts a bunch of free gyms and he endows them so the gyms could be completely 100% free. That was his original intention. All right, everyone on board so far? I'm staying at the Wyndham right next to Planet Fitness. Where it's like 10 bucks a month or something, right? Well, this isn't 10 bucks a month. This is free, was his intention. Now, imagine if over time, after this guy dies, over time, the gyms change their policies. The first gym is free to all. The second gym, they start to charge $50 a month for membership. And the third gym is free to join, but they decide it costs $50 a month to keep your membership. And the fourth gym says it's free, but then they say, but genuine members pay 50 bucks a month. And then let's say the fifth gym charges 50 bucks a month, theoretically, but if you, if you can't pay it, you have to try to at least pay something every month. They're willing to kind of like, you know. <clears throat> now my question to you guys is, which of these gyms is actually free? Which gym stayed free? Come and sit, yeah. Which one? Only the first. Only the first one. Would you agree? Does everyone agree that only the first gym is ultimately still free? I need to hear a response from you. Yes. 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 So this guy starts all these free gyms, but they all change except for the first. Um, I got started. I'm from Montreal, second largest French city in the world at the time. I think. Uh, after Paris, but now I think the two largest French cities in the world are, are in Africa now. But at the time, it was the second largest French city in the world. And I got my start preaching, preaching on the streets of Montreal. This is like uh, Mount Royal. It's a part of Mount Royal. It's the middle of the island. is like this hill that we call a mountain, but it's really just a hill. And by the way, you know, have you ever, have you ever heard like grandparents say, oh, I used to have to trudge through the snow uphill to both school, ways. uphill both ways? Both ways. Mm -hmm. That's true. I had to go to school through the snow uphill both ways. You know why? Because you go up the hill this way, then you go down to school, and when you go back home, you have to go up the hill again. Oh, no. Yeah, but did you have shoes on? I had <laughs> shoes. I had boots. Yeah. I had boots. <laughs> but, so I got my start street preaching in Montreal. I was, uh, I don't know, 18 or 19 or something like that, and I just wanted everyone to know the gospel, because Montreal is a very godless place. It's like less than 1% of the people there are born again Christians. And I was really intimidated at first because I was like, I'm going to have to know, I mean, Montreal or Quebec, this province of Quebec is like a, this spiritual void. Like the Catholic Church, kind of like uh, everyone left the Catholic Church in the 60s, and it created this enormous spiritual void there that was <coughs> filled with every type of cult that you can imagine, and some, some that are just unique to Quebec. Like we have this cult called the Raelians, where they worship aliens. This former race car driver said he met some aliens, and he started this new religion based on that. And so we have all kinds of weirdos in Montreal. And I thought I would have to know about every single one of those religions in order to communicate the gospel effectively to them. And what I quickly found out was it really didn't matter what religion they belonged to because they all basically had the same scheme of salvation. They all believed that in order to get to heaven, nirvana, paradise, or whatever, <laughs> you had to do what? Works. 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 You had to be a good person. It didn't matter if they were Muslim. It didn't matter if they were Raelians. The, Ra the aliens were only going to take the good people. You know, Allah is only going to accept the, the good people, the martyrs, the people who have done that good work. Um, and so that was basically the, the basic framework. All religions in the world basically believe in salvation by works. And unfortunately, a lot of Christian ones do too. Have you encountered maybe that in your experience? Christians that believe in salvation by works in some way, shape, or form. 
So w why is it important to emphasize the one condition of salvation? Faith. That's the theme for this topic. Who denies salvation by faith? Well, everyone, everyone says they believe in faith. Every Christian tradition says that they, they love faith and faith is important. But do they really believe it? Uh, here's a typical Roman Catholic apologist. Uh, it is not faith alone. And it's not works alone. It is faith first and works following. Each flowing from the wellspring of grace, springing from the wounded side of the crucified Christ. So he gets the word grace in there. But ultimately, what, and he mentions faith, but what else do you need to do? Works. works. And it turns out, if you don't do enough works, guess what? You can't be saved. That's just one typical, typical example. In the Eastern Orthodox Church, this is their, in their uh, large catechism. What is necessary in order to please God and to save one's own soul? In the first place, a knowledge of the true God and a right faith in Him. So, an emphasis on faith. But then, in the second place, a life according to faith and good works. Good works. So, what do you need in order to save your soul? Faith plus works, right? So between Catholicism, that's like what? Like a, like a billion nominal Christians? And like Eastern Orthodox is like 250 million nominal Christians? I say nominal because to be a member of that church you just need to be baptized as a baby. It doesn't depend on what you believe. Reformed Baptist. Who's familiar with John Piper? He's, I, you know, I, I, I think I've benefited from several of his writings. But look what he says on the question of salvation. And he's writing about Someone else's, um, someone else's book. That Tom Schreiner, that was, was that you? Okay. No, yeah. Bad on you, bad on you. Okay. Tom Schreiner teaches at Southern Seminary, Southern Baptist Seminary. He says, as Tom Schreiner says, this is a, a forward to Tom Schreiner's book. The book tackles one of the fundamental questions of our human condition. How can a person be right with God? The stunning Christian answer is sola fide. So that's great, right? Faith alone. So we're like, yay, John Piper believes in faith alone. But be sure you hear this carefully and precisely. He says, right with God by faith alone, not attain heaven by faith alone. There are other conditions for attaining heaven. Huh? But no others for entering a right relationship with God. <coughs> so you can have a right relationship with God, but you can't get into heaven. In fact, one must already be in a right, right, right relationship with God by faith alone in order to meet the other conditions. I can have another quote where basically Piper believes you need to persevere in good works in order to attain heaven. So it's like you, you kind of get in by faith alone, but you got to stay in by meeting these other conditions. And this is a major evangelical dude. Any, any Christian bookstore you walk into, they're going to have his books. And it's interesting, there's a lot in the blogosphere, all kinds of Calvinists are kind of going nuts about John Piper coming out and saying this because they're like, you're teaching salvation by works. So even they recognize it, not just us. Church of Christ. I have a lot of family members for a Church of Christ and they're very serious Christians, but this is what this is what they think the conditions of salvation are. The scriptures are real to us what we must do in order to be saved. Believe, confess, repent, be baptized, and you to be obedient. obedient. Is that sola fide? No. Is that faithful? No, that's faith plus all kinds of it. So, do the Roman Catholics believe the gym is free? No. No. Do the Eastern Orthodox believe the gym is free? Nope. No. What about the Reformed Baptists like John Piper? No. What about Church of Christ? No. Nope. They're like, no, you got to pay 50 bucks a month. They all have their different ways of kind of including the 50 bucks a month. But at the end of the day, they're all like, you need to pay 50 bucks a month in order to be a member of this gym. You need to do good works in order to save your soul. This is the, I think I've hit basically the majority, I could, have, I could have come up with some charismatic quotes as well. But at the end of the day, most Christian traditions, at some way, shape, or form, reintroduce works into the condition of salvation. Um, yeah, so the majority of Christendom says the gym isn't free. They teach faith plus. So 
So what does Jesus say? Oh, and by the way, let me use this illustration. When I, when I married my wife in 2006, 2005, but then in 2006, I started the immigration process here, and I decided I don't need a lawyer to do this. I can figure it out. And uh, big mistake, don't do that. Get a lawyer. It's a lot easier. I made a whole bunch of mistakes. And for about a year, I had to. Sp I spent my time kind of crossing the border, and every time I crossed back into the States through Burlington, Vermont, uh, I'd just lay my guts out and just say, I'm so stupid, I decided to do this process myself, I'm making all kinds of mistakes, please let me in and see my wife. And they'd always let me, they'd be like, you're an idiot, but come on in, all right? <laughs> come on back into the country. Um, I remember once I was crossing over back into stateside through Vermont, and one of the questions they always ask you is, uh, do you have any fruits? Do you have any fruits in your, your car? And I was like, uh, I was like, no, no, I just have this orange, thing, just orange here for my lunch. I'm like, you can't, you can't bring that across the border. And I'm like, oh, but I'm just going to eat it for my lunch. I'm not, I'm not like a fruit producer or whatever. And they're like, sir, you can't have it. It's a contamination issue. And I was like, this is a Florida orange. I'm bringing it back home. This is, this is one of your people. I just, I just want to eat this orange. I had to give it up. I don't know what that, I had to give that orange up. Now, here's my question to you. Does it matter that the orange was in the front seat of my car, or in the back seat, or in the trunk, or if I was like hiding in the wheel well? Am I allowed? It does, it does matter where the orange is. This is kind of a crazy illustration, right? The orange can't cross the border, right? It doesn't matter where it is in the car. Same thing with the gospel. The gospel is faith apart from works. And it doesn't matter where you try to sneak in the works. It's faith apart from works. <clears throat> let's see what Jesus says. Let's see, if, let's see if that's what Jesus says. So every book in the Bible has a different purpose. Uh, where do you turn to if you want a book of hymns in the Bible? Oh. Psalms. If you want a history of Israel's monarchy, where do you go? King's Chronicles. Mm -hmm. Very good. King's Chronicles. If you want to learn how to do priestly sacrifices, where do you go? Leviticus. If you want to know how God created the world, Genesis, Job maybe too. If you want to know how the world will end, Revelation. So every book of the Bible, it's really not, the Bible's not a book, it's more like a library. And every book kind of has its own purpose. Some, some purposes are easier to discern than others. Turn, if you have a Bible, go to John's Gospel. Go to John's Gospel, what, chapter 20. Go to chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. You might want to highlight this in your Bible. When you're asking the question, well, why was John's gospel written? Here's what John says. And truly, Jesus did many other signs. So he's kind of summarizing the book. Many other signs in the presence of his disciples. And by the way, so the risen Jesus just appeared to Thomas, basically. And Thomas has just made this enormous declaration, my Lord and my God. And so this is kind of a sign. Truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So if John was written so that the readers may believe, what does that tell us about their current state of faith? Do they believe currently, yes or no? No. No. Because he's writing so that they may believe. That you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Do they currently believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Apparently not. And that believing you may have life in his name. Do they currently have life, yes or no? No. So who is John's gospel written to, ideally? Unbelievers. It is the one book of the Bible that ex explicitly tells us this is written to unbelievers. This is written so that to teach unbelievers how they might have what? Life. And he's not talking about physical life, right? Because he's obviously writing to people who are physically alive. What kind of life is he talking about? Eternal life, Eternal life spiritual life. Well, so let's go to John's Gospel. If John's Gospel is written to teach unbelievers how to have eternal life. What does he say about it? 
So we can assume that whatever he says, he's not going to leave out any essential condition. If there's an essential condition to have eternal life, John will make that clear. Now John is just summarizing, he's picking kind of elements of Jesus' ministry. So he's, he's taking a segment of Jesus' ministry in order to make this point of how to have this certain kind of life. Other Gospels emphasize other aspects of Jesus' ministry, and we'll touch on those in a couple of mm -hmm. thoughts. John 3, 6, 15 to 16. Whoever <coughs> in him should not perish but have eternal life. So there's that eternal life. You know, you're talking about, I ask my kids, what does eternal mean? What does eternal mean? How long does it last? Forever. Forever, right? So when I, I, when I explain it to my three-year-old now, it's forever life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes, believes in him should not perish but have an everlasting life. So sometimes your English translations will use eternal or everlasting interchangeably, but there's really no difference. So what is the one condition to have this eternal life, according to this passage? Belief. Belief. Are, is there works in here? Nope. Is there baptism in here? Nope. nope. Is there a lifetime of obedience in here? Nope. Just belief, right? And do you think Catholics and Orthodox and Reformed Baptists and Church of Christ people would say, I don't believe John 3.16? Or would they all claim to accept it? Mm -hmm. They would all claim to accept it. Yeah. But are they seeing what it actually says? Nope. Talking to a, a drunk guy, maybe a couple, three years ago maybe, and um, he wanted some money. And, and I've kind of flip-flopped on my policy whether to give money to, to pen handlers. But I was like, oh yeah, I'll give, you, I'll give you some money. And I said, but do you know John 3.16? And he said, absolutely, I know John 3.16. He says, I got saved in the Baptist church in Oklahoma and pastor so-and-so, he discipled me, and I've just, I've just fallen on hard times and I've just made a bunch of bad decisions, but absolutely. And honestly, that can happen to anyone, right? Anyone just the right set of bad circumstances, I could be that guy. So like, well, tell me what John 3.16 says. And so he said it, said it in the King James, kind of off the top of his head. And I said, so, so what's the condition to like go to heaven when you die? And he said, be a good person. <laughs> and I said, wait, wait, no, 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 wait, no. Just say John, what does John 3, 16 say? And he's like, you need to get baptized. And honestly, that is what he said. You need, you need to give money to the poor. And I was like, no, go to John. What did you just say? What did you just say? And then he's like, believes. And I was like, yes. And what do you get if you believe? And then he kind of, you know, people know it, but they don't know it. And you have to kind of like, you've got to dig a little bit. John 3, 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe. believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me. So, so hearing isn't a secondary condition. You need, to, you need to receive that word, that promise, some way, shape, or form, whether it's reading or hearing or whatever. But then you've got to believe it. But said he has everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death into life. Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God. So I think Jesus is kind of being tongue-in-cheek here. They're like, what kind of works do we need to do? And go, Jesus is like, this is the work of God. That you believe. believe. Get that straight first. Because we're going to find out works are important, but not for having eternal life. Uh, believe in him whom he sent. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who... He believes in me has everlasting life. So if you're an unbeliever reading John, reading, reading how Jesus evangelized, what is the one condition that should be clear to you to have everlasting life? What's the one condition? Believe. Now, works are important. Loving your neighbor is important, but we're going to see that what has happened in Christianity is they don't know, people don't know what to do with this work stuff. And so they just assume it must be a co-condition with faith for salvation. <coughs> John repeatedly makes believing the condition to have eternal life. If John had wanted to teach faith plus works, or if Jesus had wanted to do that, uh, he could have very easily, but he didn't. What does Paul say? When God told Moses, you know, the positive command should be enough. Just simply saying, if you believe you have everlasting life. When God told Moses, make the ark out of gopher wood, did God have to go and say, and don't make it out of elm, don't make it out of hun, don't make it out of... Did he have to do that? Nope. Because the positive command automatically excludes any other option, right? 
If you go at a restaurant and you order uh, ribeye or prime rib or something, do you really need to say, don't bring me the tofu, don't bring me the salmon, don't bring me this, don't bring me the quiche, I don't want the burger, I don't want the lasagna. The positive command should be enough, right? But some people are a little dull. And sometimes you have to be even more explicit. So what does Paul say? I love this verse. Go to Galatians 2.16. Highlight, highlight that verse. Put a circle around it. Can Paul make it any clearer? Knowing, now there's, there's three things. There's three reds and there's, there are three blues in this one verse. He's going to say we're justified by one thing, not by this other thing. He's going to say it three times. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be Justified by faith. faith in Christ and not by or, for by the works of the law. Sorry, this is this my my you know our, our interaction here is kind of this is a little choppy, but okay, we're, we're gonna hang with it. Okay, by, by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So we're justified by what? And we're not justified by what? Works. Can Paul make it any clearer? No. He says it three times in like in, in one sentence, right? Yes, by faith. No, by works. Yes, by faith. No, by works. Yes, by faith. No, by works. I do not want the tofu. I do not want the lasagna. I want the ribeye. Ribeye, ribeye, ribeye. No, no salmon. No this, no that. Right? Yes, by faith. No, by works. Works don't work. Romans 3.20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified. The law is basically the record of all the good works that God wants. Those are the good works that God has approved of. God commanded these works. And that even though God commanded these works, no flesh will be justified in his sight by doing them. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. What the law does is just a mirror to show you how far you've fallen. It's basically to show you, oh, you, you didn't do, it's like, it's like uh, my son. Uh, he's a lot better now, but we're, we're trying to teach them all to kind of be clean, to clean themselves, you know, and uh, uh, sometimes when he's getting ready for church, the girls are very good at this. The girls are, they, they're, they're pretty careful about, you know, what they look like and stuff. But Zane is a kind of a little haphazard about what he looks like, and he'll wear stuff inside out and backwards, and he won't. <laughs> and I'll be like, Zane, did you get ready for church? And he's like, absolutely, I'm ready. Did you brush your hair? Yes, I did. Did you wash your face? Absolutely. And I'll be like, go to the mirror. Go look at yourself. Oh, they're just yogurt, you know, yogurt, dry booger stains. His hair is just, you know. And he'll look in the mirror and he'll be like, I was a yeah, yeah. Now, can the mirror wash his face for him? No. Can the mirror wash his face for him? No. Can it comb his hair for him? No. It can just tell him that he did not actually get ready for church, right? <laughs> the law is the same thing. The law can't make you obey. The law can say don't do that, but it can't make you not do that. It can just only kind of show you, oh, you messed up here. Your hair is all over the place. You have boogers all over the place. <laughs> That's the purpose of the law. And Paul will explain that the law was really meant to show us why we needed a savior. Every religion in the world is like, I'm just climbing up this ladder to salvation, but the law is there to show you there's no way you can save yourself by grace. You can't even be mostly good one day. You're going to fail in all of these, at least one, at least one of these commandments. Still, even though Paul says all this, some people will say, but it's faith with works, right? For by grace you've been saved, faith. and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But Paul, we've got to at least try our best, right? I love this verse. Highlight this in your Bible. You have to try your best to be saved. What does Paul say? And Paul, I, he must have been at the end of his rope with, with all these Gentiles and people just trying to sneak the orange across the border, right? And you know, he's like, he's saying, no oranges. You cannot take this orange across the border. What does he say? But to him who does not work. Say does not work. Does not, does not work. But believes on him who justifies the ungodly. Who does God justify? The righteous 
No. Who does God do? But God is saying your best works that you are so proud of, that you think you're going to be saved on the basis of, they are unclean things, David. And in Old Testament society, when a woman was in that period, she was off limits for like seven days. She was like ceremonially unclean. You had to stay away from her. So it was far more strict than we are today. So that's what our works are like. That's why your only hope is faith in Jesus. Because your best is just an unclean rag to God. But what does it mean to believe? This is where a lot of people get confused. What does it mean to believe? This is where a lot of Christianese, Baptistese, I'm a Baptist, and there's all kinds of Baptistese language that gets in here. And one of the, I think the number one error that I fight every day, that we're always talking to people every day, and this has been true ever since uh, Martin Luther, the great reformer, kind of rediscovered Paul's doctrine of justification, is what does it mean to believe? A lot of people want to redefine faith to put good works in there. They'll say, I believe in justification by faith apart from works, but then you have to ask them, well, what do you mean by believing? And they're going to sneak that orange in the trunk of their car. We call it backloading the gospel. It's like, you don't put the works in the front seat, you kind of hide it in the, in the trunk. Uh, Art Farstad. Uh, this is on our website. Um, sometimes in English we get confused. What's the difference between faith and belief? Well, that's just an oddity of the English language. In Greek, it's the same root word. And he says, oddly enough, the most important gospel word family in the Greek New Testament is obscured in English. This is because we translate the Greek verb pistuo by the Anglo-Saxon word believe and the related noun pistis by the totally unrelated word faith. So Greek has kind of the one kind of root, pistuo and pistis, and then we have two different completely, or two words that originate completely differently, Anglo-Saxon and so that kind of gets confusing. So sometimes pastors are kind of weak on languages, uh, and I'm, I'm not great on languages, but they'll make a big deal out about the differences in the English words. Well, faith is one thing, but what you really need to do is believe. But that's just not, that's not merited by the Greek. At least partly due to the Slavic. So lack of similarity, many preachers who are weak on grace are able to maintain that the Greek line behind one or both of the English words includes a whole possible agenda of works such as commitment, repentance, perseverance, etc. So people say, we're saved by faith apart from works, but faith means you have to be totally committed to Jesus. Or you have to uh, repent of all your sins. That's what it means to believe. That's not what it means to believe. Some people use the typo illustration. <coughs> you heard this illustration where, where uh, uh, Blondin is crossing Niagara Falls on a, on a tightrope and he has a uh, wheelbarrow. And he asks the people, he crosses it without anyone in it, and he crosses over it. He says, do you believe I could carry someone across this tightrope with a wheel in a wheelbarrow? And everyone goes, yes! And he asks the gentleman who says, yes, well get in and I'll prove it to everybody. And that guy says, no way! And that illustration is supposed to show what saving faith is. Saving faith is not just saying yes, saving faith is actually getting into the wheelbarrow. And if you haven't got into the wheelbarrow, whatever that is in Christianity, then you're not really saved. Who's heard that illustration before? Or sometimes it's like getting on, getting on an airplane, or yeah, sitting in a chair, or whatever. It's always like, saving faith is doing this thing. So their takeaway is, if you don't get in, you don't really believe. Hence, if you don't live a life of good works, you don't really believe in Jesus for salvation. But I just want to say, that's not an illustration of faith salvation. It's an illustration of faith plus work salvation. It's saying, I don't, you know, getting in is a work. Getting in the wheelbarrow, sitting in the chair, getting on the airplane, whatever it is, that's the work that you have to do. So that's an illustration, you're saying it's an illustration of faith, but really it's an illustration of faith plus works. And the truth is, sometimes we act according to our beliefs and sometimes we don't. It all depends on our will. We have this little thing called a free will, and we can know that something is right. And we can choose to obey or disobey. We can believe that it's, you know, we can believe that it's wrong to commit adultery or, or get divorced or whatever it is, and yet we can still choose to do it because we have a will. So our beliefs and our actions are connected by this little thing called the will. And don't ever confuse your actions for the belief. So what does it mean to believe? It just means to be persuaded that something is true. Art Farstad. Actually, believing faith as the Greek shows or just the verb and the noun for a concept. That's really no different in English than in Greek. That concept is taking people at their word 
trusting that what they say is true. I'd say more broadly, it's being persuaded that any, if, you, if you're persuaded that something is true, you believe it. Or if you believe that it's false, then you believe that it's false. What was the nature of Abraham's faith? In Romans 4, 20 and 21, this is how Paul describes it. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Abraham was persuaded that God's promise that he'd have a son was true. It had nothing to do with his works. There's no work. It's totally being persuaded that God is going to do this thing that he promised. So when Jesus promises you everlasting life. He says, if you believe in me, you will have everlasting life. Believing that promise is simply being persuaded that Jesus can do what he's, he promised to do. It's being persuaded that Jesus, yes, can give you everlasting life. It's not about commitment. It's not about baptism. It's not about doing the life of good works. It's not about being a missionary. It's not about leaving sins behind. It's just being persuaded that Jesus can do what he just promised he was said he would do. How long does it take to be saved. Some people say the Greek present tense can indicate a continuous faith. So they say you need continuous faith in order to be saved. Well, is that true? Well, when you look at the different illustrations Jesus uses for faith, you can ask yourself, well, does this fit with a moment of belief or does this fit with a lifetime of belief? <coughs> One of the illustrations he uses in John 3 with Nicodemus is of the bronze serpent. Who remembers the story of the bronze serpent? Israel was bitten by snakes, and they were dying. And then what did God tell Moses to do? Lift it up. Make a staff, make this bronze serpent, put it on. And then what did the people have to do in order to be saved from the snake? Okay. Just look at it. Well, Jesus uses this illustration for faith. Now, what kind of a look did the people have to give? Did they have to give a lifetime, continuous look in order to be saved? How long did it take? Instantaneous. Right, instantaneous, right? One look and you were healed. It's not like you had to keep on looking at it for 50 years, and if you stop looking, you suddenly die of a snake bite. That doesn't fit, right? Another illustration Jesus used was of birth. Birth from above, new birth. Okay, I understand that the moment of birth is not instantaneous, instantaneous, but is it a lifetime process, or does it kind of happen in a, in a moment? Right? Moment. Moment. Lifetime or moment? Moment. moment. In John chapter 4, he's using the illustration of the woman. He's talking to the woman at the well. And in contrast to her having to go to this well over and over again, day after day after day, Jesus says, if you would have asked, I would have just one drink, and you would have been, your, your thirst would have been satiated forever. Just one drink. So is the one drink an illustration of a continuous lifetime faith or a moment? A no. moment, right? Just take one drink, it just takes a second. So if you're not sure, my answer to the people who say, well, the Greek could mean continuous faith, I'll say, yes, it could. But all the illustrations clearly show which interpretation was right. If you had to choose between continuous or moment, all the illustrations show that it's just a moment of faith. Because what happens when you believe in Jesus for eternal life? You get born again. What does that mean? It means that you're, do you get born again in your body? Do you become more handsome or taller or you know, less fat? Does your body change at all? No. Do you, get, do you get transformed in your mind? Do you become a Christian genius 30 seconds after you're born again? No. No. You get born again in your inner man, your spirit. And that happens in a second. If someone, if a lady was driving a car and she hears a gospel message on the radio and she hears a message of eternal life for the first time and she believes it, and then she gets into a car accident five minutes later, does she have eternal life? Yes. Yeah. Let's say she gets into a car accident like uh, an hour later, does she have eternal life? Yes. Unless she gets into a car accident a day later, does she have eternal life? Yes. Because it doesn't matter how long you believed, right? No. She got born again in the second she believed. It doesn't matter how long you believed. You're born again in the second. Just like you're born, you have a physical birth in a moment, you get born again in a moment. What did Jesus promise? Sometimes people believe in Jesus and they're really not sure what they're believing in him for. I think this is especially bad in our kind of prosperity gospel culture. People are believing in Jesus for all kinds of different things. 
more beautiful hus uh, wife or a handsome husband. I remember my very first prayer when I was a teenager. I, I wasn't really raised in a Christian home. My very first prayer was for a what? Any, any guess what a teenage boy uh, might pray for? Uh, 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 <laughs> Lord, I don't know if you're out there, but make that girl like me, and then I'll know. Make all the know. <laughs> so people are believing in Jesus for all kinds of crazy things, right? Not, I mean, understandable. They're believing in them all kinds of things. But Jesus, just as Abraham believed in God for a son, we have to believe in Jesus for something. So what do we believe in Jesus for? Um... So we're believing in Jesus for eternal salvation. Yeah. When you're evangelizing someone, don't just tell someone to believe in Jesus and then leave them hanging. Tell them what they need to believe in Jesus for. He's the Savior. Some people say, I've met, I have met theologians with doctoral degrees, and I've argued this with them, and they say, all you need to do is believe that Jesus is your Savior. You don't need to believe in Him for eternal life. And I'm like... How can you believe that he is your savior if you don't know what kind of salvation he is bringing? If someone thinks that Jesus is just their savior and you're like, well, what does that mean? I don't know. Or a lot of people think he's my savior because he gives me a chance to save myself by my works. He's my savior because, because he gives me that kind of divine oomph that I lacked before so that now I really can climb up the ladder of salvation. So you have to make clear when you're evangelizing, what are we believing in Jesus for? And the language Jesus used was, believe in me for eternal life, for an everlasting life. And when did Jesus say that believers get everlasting life? This is a huge thing that I find in um, Christian, the Christendom circles. Everyone is thinking that Jesus kind of gives them a chance to save themselves, and so that salvation is something future that they hope that when they die, that they'll be good enough, that they'll go to heaven when they die. It's like a future thing that they're really uncertain of. Jesus has given me a chance to prove myself, and one day after I die, maybe if I'm good enough, I'll be saved. But when did Jesus say the believer gets everlasting life? Yeah. He promised that believers have. Mm -hmm. What is the what is the um, uh, significance of the present tense of have? When does the believer have? Now. Right? Yeah, present. It's a present. You get eternal life now. That's the salvation Jesus promised. Not a chance to get it in the future. The moment you meet the condition, so it's a, it's a subjunctive, right? Whoever believes, if you meet the condition, then you have. So if you believe in Jesus, what do you have? Eternal, eternal life. life. And as I explained to my three-year-old, what does eternal life mean? It is forever life. So can you lose forever life? Nope. It's forever, right? Yep. Uh, people get confused about this all the time. Uh, I, I, I like to compare it to <coughs> vampire movies. I don't think those are popular <laughs> so much anymore, but they were for a very long time. And uh, what are some different... So vampires are supposed to be immortal, but what are some of the ways that uh, you can kill a vampire? Stay through the heart. What else? Silver bullet. Silver bullet. What else? <laughs> Chop their heads off. Sunlight. Uh, garlic. Cross. Garlic. Uh, silver swords. Whatever. It's almost as if Hollywood doesn't know what immortal means. Because <laughs> it turns out vampires are really easy to kill. <laughs> so they're immortal, but they're dying all over the place. <laughs> and so a lot of Christians think, I'm, I believed in Jesus for this eternal life, and you can lose it in a heartbeat. It's almost as if they don't know what eternal means. So you've got to make that clear. You've got to say, Jesus gives you eternal. Eternal is forever. You can't lose it. If you could lose it, it wouldn't be eternal. It's not probation. He doesn't give you a chance. He doesn't give you probation. He doesn't give you temporary life. He gives you eternal life. A lot of people don't understand that. And I'm coming to the end here. Application. Be clear when you're evangelizing. Make absolutely clear about what a person has to do. I was just in a VBS and I was so disappointed. It was a VBS that my kids went to. And there was an evangelistic presentation at the last day. And um, the speaker went up. And the speaker said, uh, Kids, um, what we want you to do is make a decision for the kingdom. And that's how he evangelized. He said, make a decision for the kingdom. And there's a bunch of five-year-olds. And I know my five-year-old is like, and he's like, who made a decision for the kingdom? Zane was like, 
<laughs> Does anyone else you know, put up their hands? What does decision for the kingdom mean? What does that even mean? <coughs> You're deciding that it exists. Does he even know what a kingdom is? I mean, he kind of understands you know, Legos and stuff. What's a kingdom? Some people say, make a decision now. Make a commitment now. Give your life to Christ now. Invite Jesus into your heart. Do you know how confusing it is to a little kid when you tell them you have to invite Jesus into your heart? They're thinking of Santa Claus fitting down a chimney. How does Jesus fit into my heart? Does he come into my mouth? Or does he live there? I don't feel anything. They start looking for feelings to know if they're saved or not. Just use Jesus' language. Be clear about what to do. What you need to do is believe. believe. Be clear about what to believe in. Or who to, sorry, who to believe in. Who are we believing in? Jesus. If they don't know who Jesus is, then keep on explaining to them. Tell them about who, what he did, who he is, the things... Most people will need to be like, why should I believe in this Jesus for eternal life? So tell them about what Jesus did. And then be, be clear about what to believe in him for. We're believing in him for not for a new suburban or a better job or a raise or whatever. We're believing in him for eternal, eternal life. In some, drop the Christianese and use Jesus' own language when you're doing evangelism.